So this, this is an economy that's starting to export more relative to its past and relative to the previous growth model. And by the way, the consequence of those two graphs is that the current account deficit is coming down. That is, we are relying in the day-to-day -day sense. We have a huge external debt, um, especially to China, but, but we are evolving away from that growth pattern. Some of you know the Chinese are also evolving on the opposite side away from the very high current account surplus pattern. <clears throat> this is based on very recent research that we haven't published yet, but I thought I'd show it to you. So this, in, the, in any advanced economy, the, the non-tradable side, uh, you'll have to take my word for this because it takes a lot of data to prove it and we don't have time tonight. The non-tradable side is about two-thirds of the economy. It, it, it's got huge things in it like uh, government, healthcare, retail, hospitality, hotels, foods, and restaurants, construction, all that sort of thing. Uh, so it's about two-thirds, a little more in terms of employment. The tradable side is what you'd expect. It's, uh, it's manufacturing, or most of the manufacturing components of the supply chains, and it's a whole host of increasingly tradable services in finance, managing multinational enterprises, consulting, designing, computers, IT outsourcing, etc. things that you're very familiar with. That's the, that's the growing part because the scope of that is getting bigger. So what you see here is that the tradable sector, while it's only a third of the economy, is a substantial contributor uh, to growth because value added, increments in value added are just growth in the economy. Um, but, what, but the thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the right hand side of that graph. In the post-crisis period, this third of the economy is contributing over half the growth. And that shouldn't surprise you, given the negative demand shock killed the non-tradable side. So it's an economy that has the flexibility to flow toward the external demand. In the course of that, it's becoming more competitive. You know, wages and incomes are not going up very fast because of unemployment levels. The exchange rate probably the real exchange rate is probably depreciated, has depreciated a little bit, and that helps. And the rest of it is sort of a very, very dynamic uh, economy. There's lots of things that are wrong. So that's, in some sense, a picture of what's going on. If you look at, at employment, and I'll come back to this later, employment is a different story. Uh, but even, but the message from this set of graphs just various periods coming into the, to the crisis and then just after. For the most part, the, the, the tradable sector in, in the American economy, and it's not unique in this respect, uh, didn't generate much employment. In fact, it generated no net employment over 20 years. When I first sort of started to talk about that based on the data from the economy, people were just shocked. Uh, but it isn't surprising. Uh, it's a combination of technology and global forces operating on the economy. But even there, the tradable sector, with lots of headwinds in, in terms of long-term trends, is starting to generate employment. Um, and finally, this is uh, just a, a numerical calculation. So 56% of the growth, just doing growth accounting, is in the tradable sector so far in the post-crisis period and 44% in the non-tradable sector. And, I'll, and I, I apologize for being nerdy, but, but I, let me tell you some, one other thing about the connectivity between these two sectors. These two sectors are con connected to each other in terms of competing for resources in the fac factor markets, but they're, other, they're also connected to each other in the demand structure of the economy. And so when you generate income, on the tradable side, because that's the growth engine and you're starting to do it there, it very quickly generates demand on the non-tradable side. So the growth accounting probably fairly seriously understates the causal contribution of the tradable side to the growth. Uh, this is total employment. You can see it um, lagging uh, relative to domestic products. So employment on the l upper left uh, gross domestic product uh, down on the right. Uh, and gross domestic private investment is still well below where it was. Why? Because they, we still have a very large output gap 
that was caused by the negative demand shock. So we're not going to get the domestic component of that investment back until we largely close that gap. That's slightly too simple, but, but the idea is right. <clears throat> and this is total employment from the established survey. This growth, the 1.5% to 2%, is being generated in spite of the picture that's painted here, which is the government, on, largely because of automatic stabilizers, was a growth accelerator and a demand accelerator for a couple of years. These are in quarters. After the recession started, it is now right or wrong. I mean, this is highly controversial. You have Paul Krugman on one side and the Tea Party on the other, and they don't exactly agree. And I'm not going to presume to tell you where in the middle you ought to be, except you ought, probably ought to be somewhere in the middle. But in any case, we have fiscal drag. Uh, so it shows up in employment, and it's, and it's part of the story of the partial recovery. What's the rest of the story? Why isn't it back to 3 to 3.5% three real yet? Well, the answer to that is partly this, what's right in front of you, partly residual deleveraging, the balance sheets of households, which are the, the main damage that was caused from the real economy point of view. I mean, people got quite excited about the financial sector, and if it had collapsed, they would have been right. But, but the transmission mechanism to the real economy was that we were levered up on the household side. So when the asset bubble collapsed, the effect on household net worth was huge, right? The reason the wealth effect is not so large normally is because the household sector is not over levered, right? So changes in asset values don't change net worth by a huge percentage. But when, but when you're levered up the way we were, especially in the real estate area, you can wipe out, the, I mean, everybody knows this, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you buy stocks on margin, but if you do, you shouldn't. Uh, but it's the same idea, right? You can get wiped out pretty quickly if you place the wrong bets. We wiped out an economy uh, doing that. So that process is incomplete. And the, and the other one is much longer term. There is a, and this goes back to the Growth Commission work, which said basically an, an economy, a developing economy, investing and saving at under 25% of GDP is going to start to damage its ability to sustain high growth. And of that 25%, the public sector part should be probably, though the data are terrible, in the 5 to 10 to 7% range. The American public sector investment has been way below, you know, any standard like that for a long period of time. And you all know this, those of you who come to the country, you can see it in the infrastructure. I mean, JFK looks shoddy compared to the, uh, the main airport here in the Indira Gandhi Airport. Uh, and so does LAX. So, the, and, and similar problems in the efficiency on the education side. Now look, this is, I mean, these problems are pretty general uh, across countries in the global economy, but, but, but that is eventually going to put a lid on the sustainable growth. So, so, I mean, I think you can now see why I chose the words. It's a private sector driven recovery based on structural flexibility in the economy with some residual drag as the fiscal side and the government sorts itself out and so on. There's one other issue that I wanted to mention on the way through, and that is the question of whether or not uh, the, quote, assisted growth model that we've had uh, is the main explanation of the recovery so far. Now, this isn't something we can settle right now. What is in front of you is a picture of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, uh, and it's trending up toward $4 trillion and is very likely to hit it regardless of the pace of tapering. Uh, I mean, if they drop from $85 billion to $75 billion a month, they're not going to slow it down that much uh, when Janet Yellen uh, takes office in January. Uh, but there's a growing uh, consensus that, we've, that this process provided a bridge uh, in a number of ways in the early part of the crisis. It basically elevated asset prices, not clear that had a huge effect. Uh, it lowered the cost of getting your uh, balance sheet in order by lowering the cost of debt. It repressed savers, uh, so there's benefits and costs. But, it's, but my view anyway, which I don't think is way out of line, 
is that this has reached the limits of what it's going to be able to accomplish and that the benefit cost and risk calculation is starting to tip in favor of the costs and risks. And, and I think that view will become more common in the clamor to slow this down. There's one other scary thing about this and that is if you go around uh, the world among experts and ask uh, what are the limits to this? What does theory say? You won't get an answer. So if you live in a world in which you don't know, you know, whether you're somewhere near a boundary that's causing a crisis, um, you've got a bit of a problem. And people are quite nervous about that. That's all in addition to the policy externalities that, ca that are caused, you know, in distortions in capital markets. You've been on the receiving end of that, so you know exactly what I mean. Uh, and shifts in direction, like the tapering announcement, cause extreme volatility that for a while there per people worried would de destabilize economies. Many of you have seen this graph, but I, I, I never thought I'd see this in my life. All the advanced countries are trending up toward 100%, except Japan, which is well over 200%. Sovereign debt to GDP ratio in the developing countries, for the most part, are trending down uh, in the direction of 40%. It's just the kind of reversal. But what it means is that the developing countries have, in multiple dimensions, reserves, fiscal, conservatism, and so on, uh, ammunition to deal with shocks. Not unlimited ammunition, but the advanced countries really don't. Uh, and, 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 whether, and, and I think that's a fair statement, regardless of where you come out on whether you can run up a little more debt or a little less debt. Uh, it's surely true in Italy. Uh, where irresponsible behavior with respect to debt at 120% of GDP would surely, A, tick off the Germans, B, cause concern about whether the OMT was really a bridge to anywhere, and, and C, eventually, uh, trigger instability in the sovereign debt markets as well. And the non-debt liabilities are pretty large. These are, the orange lines here are estimates of the non-formal debt liability, public liabilities in a range of, of countries. They're, they're very, very large. Um, so that's the story. I, I think I've kind of laid out what it is. Now let's try to apply it uh, to the, the other major sort of economic entity in the world, Southern Europe. Southern Europe has two problems. One is that I mean, the origin of this problem was that uh, in the post-introduction of the Euro area, the capital markets, the central bank, and everybody else treated Euro-denominated sovereign debt as equal, regardless of who issued it. That obviously is a huge mistake. Uh, and so the sovereign debt of Greece, and Italy, and Spain, and Germany carried approximately similar yields were carried as the highest quality reserves in banks and so on. And, and so a country's under pressure from powerful global forces with respect to employment and other things got inventive again. Uh, used the public purse at very low costs of debt financing to run up that side of the economy, an excess domestic aggregate demand model. Spain did something rather similar to the American pattern. They had a lever highly leveraged uh, real estate bubble that came crashing down uh, at about the same time, and so on. Uh, what happened in these economies because of the excess aggregate demand is that the uh, tradable sector wasn't perceived as a significant driver of growth, and the crowding out that I discussed um, occurred. They also are economies that have more built-in uh, kind of unionized sort of politically powerful power to raise wages. And so this is what you see. This is nominal unit labor costs indexed to 100 in the year 2000 when we got the euro for Germany and the southern European countries. And what, the, I mean, you don't have to know what the colors are, particularly, Germ except that Germany's at the bottom. And everybody else had dramatically rising unit labor costs without having an economic problem 
in terms of growth and employment, well, actually, let me be careful. Italy had a growth problem, uh, but the others were growing like a weed and running their economies on domestic aggregate demand. And when that demand crashed away as part of the, you know, uh, the process of reconfiguring the Eurozone, it has to be done structurally as well, then these people are, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 45 percent out of bounds in terms of competitiveness. Now, now go back to the story, right? The American economy comes crashing down, the, dom the ag domestic aggregate dom demand comes crashing down, but the economy is relatively competitive, got crowded out at the margin and very flexible, and starts generating growth in the tradable sector. It can't happen here. It just can't. It, and furthermore, and, and this is idiosyncratic to the Eurozone, the most important thing about the Eurozone is that when you get these divergences, the normal reset mechanism is the exchange rate. And it doesn't exist in the Eurozone. Now, if you didn't have the divergences, it wouldn't matter, much matter. But, but if you have a defective growth strat pattern that leads to the divergences, um, and defective growth um, pattern and policy that leads to the divergences, then you've got a very, very difficult uh, return to the point where you can actually generate real growth in spite of the fact that the demand is sitting there. Okay? So what you're, what you're observing in Europe now in many of these countries is this painful process of uh, reconvergence by flatlining, you know, essentially wage and incomes uh, while inflation erodes them over time. And the hope is that Germany's, Germany's not doing the same thing. Now, the people who look at this and say, how could we accelerate this without sort of giving up on the Eurozone, the answer is have inflation in Germany. I mean, real inflation. That is, including on the labor side. That's about as likely as um, my flying to the moon right after this lecture. Uh, and so that's a non-option. And it's a possibility that Germans could lever up a bit and drive up uh, domestic aggregate demand. The thing I think that's not understood, but if you start to get the drift of what I'm trying to say to you, which is put theoretically, our growth models are incomplete uh, for handling at least short and medium run issues in open, global, highly connected economies. Uh, and, 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 and so Germany could do that. They aren't going to do it. Germany therefore has an undervalued exchange rate. So in some respects, their economy is being distorted in the way the Chinese economy is distorted uh, if they sit on the exchange rate too much. That is big tradable sector, but the real cost, I mean, everybody thinks that's a terrific position to be in. It's not, actually, because the, the Chinese can do something about it by relaxing on the rate of appreciation, the Germans can't. <laughs> They've got to wait for all of the rest of us to sort of catch up before their exchange rate starts to look like the right one for their economy, uh, at which point the, the tendency to have a, an overbloated tradable sector and an underdeveloped domestic economy uh, with uh, the non-tradable sector, a lot of services and whatnot, less fully developed. Um, so we'll see how that comes out. I mean, we're watching, you know, in some sense, we're watching, you know, a, lab, a, a, a kind of real-time laboratory here uh, in terms of how these dynamics work. Uh, but anyway, main message on the German side, it is by now the biggest surplus country. Its surplus, current account surplus, in absolute terms is larger than the Chinese one. Uh, and it is, a, it is, you know, if you could get rid of it, it would do wonders. Uh, for things in the Eurozone. It's just there's no obvious way to do it. They're kind of trapped uh, the way the other folks are. These are current account balances. Uh, there, there is no economic theory that says you shouldn't run a, a current account balance, but I'm pretty sure absent theory that running a current account balance significantly higher than your growth rate for an extended period of time means somebody's leveraging up somewhere, right? Because the folks out there are lending you money. <laughs> Uh, now, you could probably figure out some theoretical way to get around that conclusion, but uh, so let me leave it as it may not be a defective growth model, you know, without qualification, but it sure is a warning sign. Uh, 
that you're going to lever up somewhere and overdevelop the domestic side of the economy and leave yourself, you know, when you really need it without the growth engine that comes from the tradable side when it has access. Now, everything I've just said is pretty common knowledge in developing countries. If you came in and said, you know, the reason you can get high growth is because domestic, the domestic demand in the early stages of growth, you know, is incapable of driving high growth. You can't specialize, you can't have comparative advantage, you don't have this huge global demand. Everybody would say, of course, why are you giving a lecture on that? What, what I'm telling you is we're starting to learn that the same principles apply to all economies you know, with appropriate modifications. But, 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 but what I've said to you, in, in, at least in parts, is familiar territory in the developing, in developing countries. Um, I won't belabor this. One thing Italians still do do is invest at relatively high rates. That's a good thing. Uh, that's too hard for you to read, so I'll leave it behind. Um, and let me just spend a couple of minutes on two things. One, the global economy and especially the higher value added part of it, the advanced countries, have significant additional problems over and above growth in the area of employment. Uh, and that's a story that started about 25 or 30 years ago because in the post-war period, in the early part of the 30 years after World War II, roughly, uh, growth and employment went together. It shows in the data. You had a recovery, you got the growth back, you got the employment back. We didn't have big unemployment problems. You know, we had a global, an increasingly well knit together global economy. So something else has started to happen. And that something else is really two things. Uh, one of them is technology. Technology, a very, not all technology, of course but a bunch of technologies that are digital in one way or another have started to take what you would, what the folks at MIT call routine jobs out of an economy. Uh, and those effects are starting to get very big. So people who processed information, people who sent out bills, you know, bank tellers, this is sometimes described as the sort of generalized ATM effect outsourcing to the consumer things that used to be done manually. That's on the sort of white collar transactions, information processing side. If you, and if you go into any major corporation now, there aren't people, you know, maintaining the general ledger. That's an antique. In fact, when I'm teaching at Stern, I tell the students that and they don't know what I'm talking about. You know, there was an age when the general ledger was maintained by a group of accountants who worked for firms. That's one, and the other one is globalization. So if you look at American economy in this respect, and you saw this once before, the combined effect of these two things is to create an employment problem in the face of a shock, a, a big distributional problem uh, in terms of where income's going in the economy, and a tradable sector that doesn't really generate a whole lot of net employment. Uh, now, the technology things are operate across the tradable, non-tradable boundary, but the globalization ones are specific to the tradable side for obvious reasons. And what's happening there, and again, you, you can see these things now, you know, from mul with multiple perspectives, but it's the same phenomenon. If the global economy now allows you to put anything where it logically belongs for a period of time, then the natural thing is to take the lower value added things out of the supply chains in the advanced economies on the tradable side. And that's what you see happening. So the tradable side generates growth, doesn't generate employment, and so it shows relative to the non-tradable side very rapidly increasing value added per worker. So the story on the, Amer I'll come back to that in one second, but the story on the American economy is we didn't have an employment problem and we solved it in two ways. One, we elevated domestic aggregate demand uh, and two, the jobs that we couldn't generate on the tradable side, we generated on the non-tradable side. Forty percent of them are in government and health care alone. And I don't think anybody thinks government's going to do that in the future. And most people think our health care system isn't exactly optimally considered, configured either. So we're in trouble. Uh, 
on jobs, but that's how we didn't have an employment problem. But those people flowing into the non-tradable sector competed, especially in the mid-range of incomes and value added, competed for those jobs and held wage and income growth down. So that's why in the American economy, which is a very market-based economy, you see that you have to get up to about the 80th percentile in the income distribution before you see a real growth in incomes. Uh, and the other thing, the, the upper line is sort of obvious. If you're growing in terms of value added and you're doing it with less people, then value added per person is, and, and the tradable sector is increasing the place where highly educated, highly skilled, uh, high income people work. Not all of them, but, but it's, it's, the, it's the territory where a very, a very large number uh, find their work, and it's rewarding. I mean, I, you know, if you switch to the sort of political economy of this and look at surveys, uh, until recently, the people who were not terribly enthusiastic about globalization were the people whose jobs on the tradable side were being uh, moved somewhere else. And the upper end of the income distribution in America is wildly enthusiastic uh, about globalization. The labor economists sort of got this wrong by thinking of the American economy as a standalone entity. So they looked at this on the tradable side and said, this is productivity growth. Well, it is to some extent, but it's also measuring something different, okay? So what I've just put up in front of you is the old supply chain with two, two batches of people, the high value added part at 20 per, person employed and the lower value added part at 10, and if they're about equal in size, you'd probably come out at an average of 15. <clears throat> and then you go to the new configuration where the 20, that, that component is still in the, in the country, and the other component is moved to somewhere else, like Mexico, and now the measured value added per person employed is 20 instead of 15, <clears throat> a 33% increase. That's not real productivity growth. That's changing the composition of global supply chains. So do we have good enough data to tell us industry by industry which fraction of you know, the value added? The aggregate productivity measure is attributable to real productivity growth, capital deepening, or this? No. Uh, we may get there someday. But if you're thinking about it, uh, See, th this was material. Labor economists were going to the President of the United States and said, you don't have to worry about the global economy. This is all productivity growth. And then they'd take them and show them a semiconductor plant where it was very hard to find a human being and say, see? And uh, some of the rest of us kind of tried to say, with all due respect, you know, the plants with people in them aren't here anymore, you know? <laughs> but they still exist. Um, anyway. Um, some of you might be interested in this, so I'll leave it behind. It's way too detailed to, but these huge spikes, red spikes, are where the big growth in the non-tradable side occurred. This is an unbalanced growth model. I mean, this is something that was uh, hard to sustain. We managed to do it, uh, and it broke. Here's the income distribution, and that green line here. That's the 80th percentile. So that's pretty modest growth. And then above that, you start to see real growth in incomes. So if you get much below the 75th percentile in the American income distribution, you don't see much growth. Uh, this is the percentage change in employment, uh, and you've seen a version of that before. And this is the thing that the MIT folks did. So here we have uh, a four-way division of employment. You. I don't know what terms you use here in India. In America, we use white and blue collar. That corresponds to the, the MIP people that thought that was sort of vague. So they used cognitive and non-cognitive. You can think of non-cognitive as manual, but you get the idea, right? You're either using your head or you're using your hands. It's a little simple, but. Uh, and then there's routine and non-routine. And what you see is there's fairly dramatic growth in non-routine manual, white collar, non-cognitive, whatever you want to call it, and very large growth in non-routine cognitive, you know, what the upper end of the income distribution does. And I don't mean the people who work with their hands don't use their brains. It's, not, it's just hard to describe this. Uh, 
but the but the but the accelerating huge drop is in in routine work and it it runs across the cognitive non-cognitive divide which is why I just put this I took this from a recent paper on the what this process seems to accelerate in after recessions occur uh, so th this is a very big headwind uh, that isn't is starting to be talked about you know we 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 right after the 